Kim Warren Martin, founder and lead strategist with Reignite Her Light, where we help women leaders recalibrate so they can make the impact they want to make in the world. I got how many seconds do I have left? Two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Come on. Glad to have you, Kim. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm Karan Bobandi. I am the founder of Optimal Access. We make conversational chatbots. We make it really easy for you to quickly curate and organize content, FAQ type content, and turn that into a conversational chatbot. Awesome. Uh, Rob Bedell, please. Hey, how are you doing, everyone? Rob Bedell. Uh, with Bedell Enterprises. I actually help business owners make sure that their businesses are working for them and not the other way around. If you know any business owners that are 8, 10, 12, 14 hour days, uh, that's probably not what they signed up for. Help send them my way and I'll help them make it to where it's the business working for them, not the other way around. Awesome. Awesome. I think uh, Jessica right, can talk about a couple of those uh, techniques as well. Uh, Kevin Foster, please. Yeah, yes, I'm Kevin Foster. My name of my company is Business Ethics Advisors, and I help companies keep their employees on the right side of the ethical line and out of prison So with, with different training programs and, and speaking. So if anybody saw my post from Tuesday, you would have seen my um, ID card after spending 28 days in solitary confinement. So I had a post regarding that, um, that experience from two days ago. Yeah, I saw that post two days ago, and I was like, I think I know that guy. <laughs> uh, Selena, you're next. Hi, I'm Selena Teal. I'm one of the co-founders of Office Mercenary, which is a group of U.S.-based virtual assistants. Uh, our goal is to get business owners back to doing what they love and back to their friends and family. Uh, <laughs> so. Ooh, awesome, awesome. Awesome. Vanita. Hi, I'm Vanita. I am in the early stages of building a business, so I'm very excited to hear what Jesse has to say today. Cool. Awesome. awesome. Glad to have you. And Vadim, is that how do you pronounce that? Yeah, Vadim would be right. Good awesome. morning, everyone. Good afternoon, actually. Uh, my name is Vadim Katzman. Uh, business technology is my bread and butter, mostly back office. We help companies who embark on complex transformational technology projects but don't have internal expertise to pull it off. Great, great. Cool. Uh, Jason Cement. Hi, uh, Jason Cement. I run an agency called Get Visible. We build websites and promote them. We do something we call transcendent marketing, which means we help clients get ahead of their competition. So, awesome. And my awesome. co-host, Fadi. Hey, everyone. It's great to see everybody. I'm also looking forward to Jesse's presentation and learning from him today. I'm a founder of Body by Fadi, a health and fitness company. Uh, now we are 99% virtual since 1999. I'm also founder of Well Plan, which is a corporate wellness program. And most recently, I've launched a passion project called Millionaire to Hero. So cool. taking companies from zero to a million dollars within one year and having a net worth of at least five million within five years. Awesome. awesome. So uh, I'm Troy. I'm kind of the not so boring LinkedIn guy. So if you guys uh, have any questions as far as strategies on LinkedIn, I help bring in high value prospects and build relationships. Um, and uh, last but not least is Jesse Gilmore. Jesse awesome. Gilmore. <laughs> the, the middle name actually allows me to differentiate myself from all the other Jesse Gilmore. So um, I'm Jesse Gilmore uh, and I transform uh, agency owners from hustlers to CEOs. And uh, I'm really excited to be a part of uh, this networking event uh, because I'm going to give a little snapshot of some of the foundational parts of the leverage for growth method, which is a method that really kind of... Um, takes a person from uh, being so close to their business to being a CEO. My main focus is based around coaching and consulting uh, solopreneurs all the way up to teams of about 15 on their journey to seven figures. And uh, today I'm going to talk about a couple different topics. Um, and at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll actually be able to give you uh, the PDF. Uh, so uh, you can take some notes, but um, uh, Troy will actually send that out. Um, here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about why entrepreneurs wear too many hats in the business, 
kind of some of the, the root causes um, that uh, start this whole process and really understanding kind of where that kind of cusp is, where it's an important transition from uh, being a hustler in your business to being a CEO in a business. And I'll talk about uh, some of those differences and then um, get really into the root cause, which ends up being time management and basically breaking down the categories of work into two categories, uh, working in the business versus working on the business. Um, and then we'll get into some actionable things uh, that you can do to start mastering your time uh, and really kind of setting up for the, uh, being a CEO of your business. Um, and then uh, at the end, I have kind of like a little checklist of what to do before hiring help. Uh, one of the questions that uh, Troy and I had talked about um, uh, before this was based around, you know, how do you know when is a time to actually ask for help? Um, and so I'll use uh, this checklist and also and go through an example of one of my clients uh, that followed this and then what their results were as well. So we'll start off with talking about why entrepreneurs wear too many hats in the business. And really entrepreneurs start businesses in two different ways. Uh, it all comes from a business idea, um, but one group of entrepreneurs get funded by either venture capitalists or uh, use bank loans in order for them to generate money. And then from there that they can start hiring help right away. The second part is based around uh, entrepreneurs that really start from nothing and do what's called bootstrapping the business where um, you're using uh, your own kind of hustle uh, to get your product and service in front of people. And so uh, bootstrapping the business happens until profits cover the expenses. And since most entrepreneurs start from nothing, without proper funding, they don't really have the money to hire help uh, from the beginning. So they have to learn aspects of the business that they're not really strong in, such as like accounting and taxes and legal, uh, legal things and uh, client fulfillment. So how do you actually deliver the product or service, uh, marketing, sales, project management, and so forth. And so in the beginning for these uh, types of entrepreneurs that start uh, based around bootstrapping, they're really uh, having to be this hustler and do whatever it takes to get the business off the ground, fixing every problem, becoming a technician as Emeth uh, would have called it. Hey, Jesse, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. Were you trying to show the presentation? Um, I can. Would you guys benefit from seeing what I'm presenting? Yeah, I think that would be awesome. Yeah. Sure. I mean, if it goes along with what you're saying. Yeah, it does. I'm covering awesome. it over here. Hold on. Let me make this bigger for you guys. Okay. Can you guys see it? Uh, yes. All right. So there are benefits to being a hustler in the beginning. Um, as a hustler, you're closest to the market feedback. So you get direct communication with your customers of what is working, what's not. Um, you start to understand every detail uh, and the way that you do things in the business is actually formed through trial and error, uh, which is also really beneficial kind of getting started uh, and kind of coasting it as it goes. And you're leading by example because you don't really have any other option. You don't have other uh, people to, um, to take over parts. Now, without understanding systems and processes, the hustler stays working in the business. So uh, they become irreplaceable to the business. If the business, um, if for some reason they get a call and they have to leave for two weeks from their business and don't have access to email or get a power outage, <laughs> yeah. um, then, <laughs> then the business basically doesn't run. And so... And the hustler mistakes their business for simply delivering the service or delivering their product and focuses solely on the service delivery. And when they hire help, uh, and they're actually hiring them to simply support them in delivering the service. And what happens is, is there's a lack of vision from the founder um, because they don't know where it's going. They're so too close to the weeds um, that the hired help usually leaves or becomes complacent due to the lack of vision. So there's really a need after a certain point where uh, you need to transition from this hustler to a CEO. And it, that's how you can start to grow your business, um, which really is focused on your use of time. So Let's get into working in the business versus working on the business. So working in the business is basically like the founder is an employee and we'll get into cash flow quadrants in a little bit to uh, further illustrate this. <clears throat> but really that's a hustler mentality. You basically own a job, you've created a job. 
And the hardest part or the biggest obstacle to getting out of working in the business is perfectionism because you've fixed every little piece of the, of the puzzle. Um, perfectionism becomes the greatest obstacle. And so when you hire help, you're kind of looking over their shoulder all the time, which makes it really hard to uh, transition to working on the business. An example is working with contractors and kind of jumping in to fix mistakes before the client sees the work. Now, in contrast, working on the business is where you're really a visionary. And uh, when in the cash flow quadrant, we'll talk about the business owner. Um, it's uh, really the CEO mentality. You own a business that owns and that sustains and grows without your direct involvement. And delegation and control are actually your biggest and greatest competitive advantages. So an example in that same uh, problem where there might be some uh, something to be fixed with a contractor, they're actually improving the communication and process checklist with contractors in order for that delivery to be right the first time so the, the fixes don't actually have to happen again. So working in the business, you're irreplaceable to your business and you must complete certain tasks in the business that are critical in order to keep the client agreements and client fulfillment processes. Working on the business, you're looking at your business as a whole system and you're starting to make improvements to the system to further enhance growth, development, clarity of vision, and also increase your profitability. Now, if you think about uh, a hustler, they do the business. Uh, you think about a CEO, they're actually delegating and setting a vision and they don't do the work. And so really what you need to start doing is making time to work on the business. Uh, before I get into time management, I'm going to talk a little bit about cash flow quadrants. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Robert Kiyosaki's uh, book, Fadi is, yeah, I got the, th the thumbs, yeah, super important. Um, where uh, on the left hand side you have the employee where you have a job you exchange time for money only way to make more money is through either a promotion or longer hours and uh, underneath that is self-employed you own a job you still exchange time and skill for money and the only way to make more money is actually increasing your rates or working longer hours business owners on the top right you own a business you don't exchange time for money instead you rely on others to run your business and in order to make more money you need to make and keep more money an investor is obviously investing in somebody else's business and having them do that for you. So your transition from hustler to CEO is also uh, identified as going from self-employed to the business owner. So really the root cause of this whole entire thing is based around time management. Now, if you're familiar with time management quadrants, we're only going to talk about the first two, um, but the quadrant is broken down based around high importance and low importance, high urgency and uh, low urgency. Quad one is where you're firefighting. Uh, this is where things that are really high important and also highly urgent. It's kind of like crises, uh, some pressing problems, deadline driven things. And basically, if you're not preventing things from happening through process and systems, you're going to be staying in the squad one for too long, and it leads towards burnout. Um, and if you look at my previous uh, LinkedIn videos and also on my website that's being launched in about a week, um, you'll hear my story about the first three businesses and staying in quad one too long. Quad two is really what you are doing when you're working on the business. It's really kind of like being in the zone. It's your focus time. It's based on prevention, uh, looking at your business as a whole system, recognizing new opportunities and starting to guide your business towards uh, the, those opportunities. So when you're working on the business, you're focused on long-term vision and perspective uh, as opposed to getting sucked into the weeds with quad one, which is working in the business. So becoming aware of when you're in quad one time uh, is really important. So identify what caused you to be firefighting in the business. So if you get a call and you're trying to get into the zone and you get a call from a client and they're like, hey, I'm just thinking about this new service. Um, there's different things that you could do, like send them a, cal a calendar link or getting different ways where you can stay in that zone for a period of time. If something's broken in the business and it keeps on coming back up, figure out how to fix it. You need to schedule time to work on quad two because it's not urgent. You literally have to make it a part of uh, your day to day weekly routine. Uh, so you need to carve out eight to 10 hours per week to work on the business. Don't let anything come in between you and this time. It is super, super, super important. So how do you master time management? There are four methods that I teach my clients and I'm sharing this with you right now and I put them in the order uh, that you do it. So 
If your first mission on this journey of going from hustler to CEO, you need to carve out eight to 10 hours per week to work on the business. There are four different ways you can do it. Number one is based on eliminating tasks or avoiding them entirely. Ask yourself a question. Is the work necessary to complete? And what would happen if it simply wasn't done? So not everything that you uh, get on your task list is actually equal of your time. So there's a thing called asymmetric returns, which is a whole nother conversation. Uh, but uh, trimming out the fat and focusing solely on the things that are small inputs that make big outputs, um, is sometimes that means that you just eliminate the work. Second thing is uh, automate or systematize. So uh, can the work be automated through the optimization of systems and software? Um, even before this, you want to do some process improvement stuff, but that's a different story as well. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so automate and systematize. So uh, for an example, um, there was uh, based around bookkeeping and trying to get uh, reports out and trying to keep my financials. I went into an, a fully automated way of uh, making it to where I didn't have to spend time doing that. That's an example of, of making it to where I'm automating or systematizing it. If you can't eliminate and you can't automate, then it's time to delegate. Uh, this is where you ask a question of, can this work be given to somebody else using processes and standardization? If it can, um, is it internally or is it external? Is it a contractor, a vendor, or is it somebody that you can have internal uh, to your team? And lastly, simplify and condense. So can this work be condensed or organized in a way that getting it completed is really easy or uh, you can time box it? Um, this is one of the most important things about anything that you seemingly do like on social media, for an example, time boxing it into I'm only going to be on LinkedIn for 30 minutes and you just go in, you set a timer and you do it as much as you possibly can. What happens is you start to prioritize what you do to focus on the small inputs that make the bigger outputs. Um, another thing is reorganizing client fulfillment work. So I work with um, all different types of agencies, uh, creative, uh, you know, full service, and sometimes uh, just a reorganization of when we uh, they meet with uh, certain types of clients. So uh, if they do website development all on a Tuesday, if they do um, you know social media management all on a Wednesday. So then when they're meeting with clients, it's like the same type of stuff going on at, at the same time. Um, that seems to help simplify the work. So now we're going to get into what to do before hiring help. And Troy had asked me, you know, do you, when do you know when to actually hire help? And the first thing is you really need to optimize and test your own capacity before you start hiring for help. Uh, it starts by regaining your time. So carving out eight to 10 hours to work on the business. You start to have that vision of where this business is going to go. You need to create a long-term growth plan. Uh, it's so, so, so important, important because growth and strategy uh, might slightly change over a period of time, but it's the tactics that change and you need to have that long-term vision. And having a long-term growth plan also helps uh, in order for you to communicate that vision to the people that are either following you uh, or a part of your, your business. And then as you're creating that growth plan, it's important to start to simplify and document your processes. So get everything out of your head and into some type of document that represents how you do what you do. So to get out of perfectionism and get into delegation, it's all based around kind of making it to where it's really, really easy for somebody to follow you uh, or for you to guide them and on how to do it. It also allows you to increase your own efficiency and enables effective delegation. Then uh, get into creating the client fulfillment. So basically once someone signs with you from beginning to end, that's client fulfillment, make it as visible as possible. So you at a glance, you're able to know where client work is. Uh, so that way you can easily prioritize. And then lastly, this is already going to increase your capacity to handle clients. And I'll talk about uh, one of my clients in just a second of using this and what happened afterwards. But you need to ramp up your client load. So then after you set this all up, it's time to fill the pipeline. So you must do everything to increase your own capacity before hiring help. Um, it makes it so that when people get hired, they actually feel as though it's a more mature organization that they're being a part of, uh, which is usually one of the harder things with younger companies to hire really good help. Um, and then also it helps you have better cash flow and um, be, it's better for the new hire because you can easily delegate uh, and guide their, uh, their training. 
So I use this with one of my clients. Um, on, why is this switching? Here, let me go to this next one. Oh, before I get into examples. Um, so here's your action items. Just to make sure uh, to carve out eight to 10 hours per week to work on the business. Again, we'll send out this uh, pr presentation so you can have this uh, for yourself. Simplify your service. So get everything out of your head into documents so it's easily delegated and managed. And then start to ramp up your client load until the system breaks. So until you, you can't literally keep up with it, uh, you've reached your new capacity and you've gotten enough cash flow in order for you to um, have hired help and then also kind of have cash in the bank to pay them uh, during that time. Let me see. Uh, let me just, uh, I, I guess it's not in the presentation. Let me tell you um, about a client that has done this. So my client, Mike, he had started before starting off with me, he was working 14 plus hours per day, uh, five to six days a week. And he was doing too many things um, and not really focusing. And he wanted to spend time with his kids. And that's, that's why he actually started the business was to make sure that the business could run without him. Uh, but he was getting stuck in it. And so within six weeks, we took that 14 hour day and brought it down to seven and a half, uh, five days a week, his weekends free. Um, and then through process improvement, we actually increased his capacity three times. So he could take on three times as many clients as he could handle in half the time, which is really six times as much capacity. And, uh, and then he kept on asking, okay, when do I bring on somebody? And I was like, you're not ready yet. You got to ramp up. So I taught him some things about prospecting and he went from generating uh, before working with me uh, four to 7,000 per month that kind of range based on referrals. Uh, in January, he had his biggest month at $20,000 uh, per month and he's still solo. Uh, and now he's ready to hire help and he's gonna be hiring help this month. And he has cash in the bank for it and everything. So <clears throat> this process works. It really is all based around, um, you know, that transition from hustler to CEO, uh, making sure you're fully ready uh, before hiring the help and um, and then ramping it up so that way you're, you're ready for that new hire. So that's that's basically it. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, we can um, either, if you want, you can put it in the chat or since we have a, a smaller group today, we can go ahead and be verbal. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, sure. If you know, kind of know your capacity or, or how long tasks take and and I'm assuming that just from our last conversation that if I need to hire the people that I need to hire they need to know what to do mm -hmm. and so those processes have to be written down and so even in my business things have matured as far as what we're mm -hmm. doing what we should be doing you know mm -hmm. and some additional ideas so all that process has to be done first I would imagine would that be correct yeah, you'd want to get it all out because you want to spend the time with your new hire training them mm -hmm. as opposed to building the process uh, documentation. And there's different ways. I mean, um, not to get so much into it, but there's different ways that you can build documentation without sitting there in front of a Google Doc and just typing. Um, you can literally, uh, Lucid Charts is a really good way of creating process flow diagrams, so making something very visible. That process flow diagram can be used in so many different ways, I can't even tell you. Um, you can build project plans out of it. You can build decision trees out of it. You can basically map it so that if someone is not really like a written learner, uh, that they can visibly see it. Um, another thing um, is you can make Loom videos. So Loom is just kind of like a Zoom, but you have like the little webcam in the bottom. Actually, Troy, you make tons of these Loom videos. Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah I'm, I'm a Loom freak. <laughs> You're a Loom guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can use those Loom videos to uh, do technical trainings. You can do all that kind of stuff. And then you can actually transcribe whatever you're trying to do through rev.com. And then you have written documentation, you have videos, you have vis a visible um, visibility. So those so six so weeks, there's a whole bunch of different. Those six weeks that you're talking about putting in um, eight to 10 hours a week, is that for the documentation? Or is that for what? What is what does that include in those six weeks that they have to get done? Yeah, a good question. So he's part of the accelerator program, which means that um, in the beginning, we yeah, the first thing we do is uh, carve out eight to ten hours um, after doing some mindset and leadership work, and then um, that's within. 
Yeah, first two weeks, we're already starting to carve out uh, eight to 10 hours. The next two weeks are based around, um, you know, simplifying their service and getting everything kind of visible. Um, the next two weeks are based around testing, uh, you know, their systems and then being able to kind of tweak them. So within six weeks, yeah, they're, they're starting to see a return on their investment already based around increased efficiency. Um, so yeah, uh, that's in the first six weeks. And then the next six weeks are based around um, increasing, sc uh, building scalable systems and also increasing profitability. A lot of my clients um, in their second month will either two or three times uh, their rates uh, just based around uh, what they've created. They can do it faster, it's more efficient um, and, and they start to separate themselves uh, from the marketplace. Um, but there's, there's a lot more to it, but yeah, that's six to 12 weeks. Got it, got it. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I, I have a couple of things that they kind of formulated in my head. I'm just trying to figure out how to ask them. <laughs> well, hey, Jesse, it's Rob. Hey, Rob. How are uh, you doing? Buddy had his hand up first. <laughs> but, uh, I was first action. Yes, you Body, were. Go ahead, Rob. Body's a little slow. He had a vacation, so he's getting over that vacation. <laughs> <laughs> he's still dancing. <laughs> uh, one of the things I, I ask, because I, I say this to I do it myself and I actually say it to other business owners I work with is when because especially when it comes to hiring I think a lot of times business so there's okay I need to hire someone full-time when if it's something that they can outsource so for mm -hmm. example you don't need to hire a full marketing team where you can outsource it to people uh, mm -hmm. you don't need to hire a full-time admin person when you can outsource mm -hmm. that responsibility once you get ramp up to a certain level then you might need those full-time people Mm -hmm. But is that the mindset that you teach people? It's like, okay, you don't necessarily need to dive fully in and take that big risk of hiring someone full time where if you have to get rid of them after two months, it's a nightmare. Yeah, uh, that, that's it really depends on the demand and the need. Um, we do uh, a well, I call it an all-star team uh, worksheet where they're actually answering certain questions. And then based on the assessment, it'll it'll tell them whether or not is it a VA that they're hiring a part-time, uh, a full-time worker or a contractor. Um, but a lot of times my, my clients are already starting to um, do the contracting. Uh, and the transition that I help them make is when when is that ongoing work um, more beneficial where you're investing into an employee's long-term um, so, yes, in answer to your question, Rob, uh, it just depends on uh, the need. Um, is it ongoing? Is it something that uh, if you have somebody uh, that starts off part time and grows into a full time, uh, is that actually more beneficial? Um, so really depends on the type of person for sure. And the need. Um, I have a, a question. Um, there are a lot of things that can kind of be reproduced. Um, I'm finding out that's a little challenging to get people to do thinking tasks that don't have a very one step one step two type type deal. Um, can some of those um, processes be streamlined so those uh, people can do more of those tasks? Because of course, there's the easy repeatable task like um, like for my business reporting, right? Mm -hmm. But replying mm -hmm. is not really the same type of animal, you know. And there's there's buffers that we use like an, an FAQ document or something like that and, and understanding the client and going through it and going through training and sitting with them and stuff like that. But is there a point where it's just not going to work or there are points where, yeah, you guys can actually make it work because that's really personally, that's kind of my, my next challenge, you know, because like you said, I'm, I'm working a little more in the business than on the business. And I like to mm -hmm. um, not, be in that position all the time. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, I can tell you right now that if anything that you are doing, uh, it can be trained and uh, trained to another person, uh, just based on whether or not it's technical or if it's creative, it can be uh, passed on to somebody else. Uh, the key is, is based around making sure that you have enough of a pool that you're uh, choosing from uh, and that you have certain criteria that uh, you institute in order for you to know whether or not a person is good for the role or, or not. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. things that is specific to your uh, business, you most likely want to have somebody that's done the replying before, has been in sales, but more of a written version of it. So I would look at like copywriters and things like that. Um, you'd also want to uh, look at their past history. Uh, mm -hmm. So something that uh, is based around 
you know, have they have they done either LinkedIn specific type of platforms where they're replying for people? Um, and then obviously, like, culture might be a, a thing based around like how do you how do you train them to be responding in the same way that you're wanting them to respond? Because mm-hmm. um, some things are based around, you know what goes on in your head about how uh, you're thinking about a certain thing uh, might be different based around just cultural differences and things like that. What I would suggest mm-hmm. is is uh, for the trainings not to always do it where somebody's over your shoulder doing it, like this is what I'm writing and things like that. Um, I would do it based around kind of grouping each one of your responses into certain categories, those categories. Mm-hmm. Um, then you create a Loom video of how you're thinking about while you're writing it. And then that Loom mm-hmm. video ends up becoming training as opposed to the job shadow version uh, mm-hmm. because uh, p- you want to be able to relate back to that certain video and go, do you see, do you remember how I was talking about this framework? Um, what were your thoughts on this one? And you can have conversations a lot easier as opposed to, do you remember when I did that two weeks ago uh, over my shoulder? So, right, uh, right. So, 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 so to just to re- repurpose what you were saying is that I've done a lot of Loom video training. Of course, I have to redo it because the offerings have evolved. And um, by, by doing that, uh, you want to go through the thought process of how I came to that conclusion um, so they can understand uh, how that works. Yeah. And there is a big cultural difference, too. Um, um, our English and UK English is much different. You know, proper English and American English is much different. Northern English versus, um, you know, California English is different as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know. I don't know about Oregon. I'm just so I'm lumping you in with California. I don't know if there's any. Dude, they're they're different, out, but that's man. a whole different. Uh, get off your whole different, tr- dude. Gosh, come on. What are you talking about, California? Relax, <laughs> chill out, man. Troy, <laughs> let let me make a suggestion. You know, I think curation can help a lot, right? So, one of the problems with video, with any kind of information access all the time, is indexing. You want people to be able to quickly index, right? So if, if, uh, if a problem comes up, to be able to have a variety of answers so that you can quickly look, read, and then trust to make the right decisions. And curation can be a really valuable tool in this sense. Indexing information mm-hmm. is really key to all of this. So I know that you do a lot of uh, curation for video and indexing and stuff like that. So if I had, and I'm just throwing this out there for thought process, if uh, typically what I do is video along with steps instructions. So they have both um, and it's in a, in a Google doc. Is that indexable? Um, I know that maybe something I'm doing will be grouped smaller because their, their tasks will include these things. So it won't be super hard to find. I don't think they need a database, but on businesses where they did, um, um, when you say indexing that, how would you proceed to index? Well, Google Docs is really, I mean, you can, but if you have a lot of information, it's really not that indexable. Mm-hmm. So the tools that we have right now, the, the content libraries, it can even be private. Mm-hmm. Indexing is a process of iteration, right? So you create some content, you put some descriptions in there, and then you put some tag taxonomy, some tags mm-hmm. to say, okay, in this situation, this is what you want to index. Then when you have a library, once you have the right indexing, people can quickly say, okay, this is, I don't know, let's take some theoretical like sales, Special well, kind customer of- support is a big deal. I mean, um, it's not a super big deal for us because we have very particular systems, but for other companies, they may have a product that requires them to fix something, you know? And so I imagine like a technical support, they would have to be able to find the information quickly. Right. Yeah. And that's, I mean, both the curation and mm-hmm. also then the conversational chatbots. So I have like right now a customer triage cancer. I just built a chatbot for them on their site. They have a lot of content about when people get cancer, they're looking for answers, right? But the way that they come to ask questions is different. So you have 
something called disability insurance with a page with all bunch of information on disability insurance. But somebody comes in and they want to talk to you. They say, hey, you know, my mom is, uh, has cancer and I have to take care of her and how do I do this? If you can now identify in that conversation the key words and get them to the right information, that's yeah. what you're talking about, right? So mm -hmm. it's a process of, of working on it, of understanding it, but indexing your content in a way that matches people's inquiries. Mm -hmm. And this is something that over time you can really build something valuable that you can pass on. And even when you bring in new people in, when you talk about training, this is something that can help transfer knowledge from person to person and make it an asset for your entire organization. Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. As long as you're matching up your taxonomy um, properly. You and, have to and you said you have iterations as well. Yeah. That's right. Iteration is the key, right? Mm -hmm. I had like a client in the UK, it was a medical insurance company. And what they found when they created the projects using our tools, it would take about two months for them to optimize the taxonomy, the organization, by having people work on the content and then give their feedback. But then mm -hmm. once they built that, after that, they, they could train people a lot faster, mm -hmm. people found the information a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So it's a process. But once you go through the process, you have a knowledge base that you can transfer very easily. Makes sense. So Jesse, um, another question too, um, you're talking about um, setting up um, information in you know, video and written format to give them the understanding of a thought process and written process in case there's some details in the written process that they're not going through you know, with, yep. the, with the video. So uh, using those things as training. So say for example, you're training someone and you have to um, kind of um, review their work. So um, um, we, if you would suggest how to train someone, is there a process that's best for that? Um, because the over the shoulder method doesn't work and you don't wanna give them a live account, obviously. You wanna yep. give them an internal account that actually works. Um, and then so um, my, my disconnect right now is like, how do I validate their training? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good question. Um, first off, you have to make sure that uh, their first 30 days is um, is really uh, focused on development and organized in a way that just makes sense. Um, because I've always been told uh, you acquire people, you develop them, then you manage them, then you audit them. And that's like the, the four steps of doing it. So if you bring it on somebody, you really need to organize kind of like their first 30 days into understanding the company, understanding kind of what their role is, how they contribute to the growth of the company, and then slowly getting into, okay, this is the nuts and bolts of, of what we do. Um, and the, the training can be really based around whether or not it's more of a technical role, uh, which kind of it, it kind of is uh, what, the one you're referring to, um, where they're replying and, and doing things like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you have to first off document the fact that they're actually going through the training and making sure in the training that you have certain um, kind of either like performance metrics or some type of measurement that under that tells you whether or not they're doing it correctly or not. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to uh, your business, a lot of it's based around qualitative. Um, so how did they respond and things like that. So your audit might actually just be how did they respond to a certain, um, you know, feed? How do they respond yeah, to somebody convert, not liking it? Convert into any kind of conversations and is the, you know, um, is the, are they accepting the invites maybe uh, versus replying to the messages? You know, it could be industry specific issues other than, you know, it could be connection issues. It could be um, initial messaging. And so trying to figure out where the pain is in, in that area, imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And based on, uh, hold on for one second, if you don't mind. Um, uh, based around uh, an individual's uh, campaign, so really, uh, we got to break this question into two different ways, Troy. So you're talking about an internal, and you're also talking about the the effectiveness of your campaign, which is based on a client. Those are two different two different things. So when you say uh, you're training somebody, you're talking about your internal person and making sure that they're doing uh, what you would want them to do in running campaigns, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, in this particular conversation, yes. 
Okay, so then the cam the campaign itself, yeah, there needs to be performance metrics from the get go. You should have uh, a certain metric that tells you about connection rates and if they're mm -hmm. you know dipping below a certain thing that's based around mm -hmm. messaging. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next thing would be based around like a welcome message. So after they get uh, connected, what's the welcome message and what percentage of those welcome messages lead towards a conversation? That'll tell you about that that message. The next one would be based around any type of follow up message. Is that sparking a conversation as well? And those those numbers are going to tell you about messaging in general. If mm -hmm. if the the portion of that is uh, once it becomes manual, then you're going in and saying, okay, what did you actually think about starting a conversation with this person? They didn't seem really. Uh, like against having a conversation, they just seemed as though um, you know they wanted more information. You say or a conversation, you mean a response, the the conver the text, the textual response that yeah. you're having back and forth. Okay. Yeah, um, and then based on that, you're you're trying to see whether or not it actually matches what your clients want and have worked before, and then that's the com mm. the comparison. It is qualitative, but you you really need to know what their thinking process is, mm -hmm. and if that thinking process is similar to what you've trained, then their performance should be should be in line with what you're going after. Very good points. I do a lot of that, but um, um, it's not defined in a format for training purposes mm -hmm. so um so yeah good point so everything you're saying is that get what's in your head down on paper absolutely mm -hmm. and track it based on metrics i mean we're we're all human and we make emotional decisions about things and subjective decisions the more you get into the numbers behind it and try to start try to figure out kind of what's a threshold what's that benchmark what's the max that you're going after um then uh, you, you know people are more motivated to hit a certain goal based on numbers than they are about like a pat on the back so if you get into that objective measurement um it's best for both your clients and also for your team as well yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I don't have any more questions. <laughs> so, you answered them very well. Right. Thanks, sure. Yeah. Does anybody else have? Oh, Vadim. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask actually you uh, just to be a little bit more provocative. I know that, <laughs> sure. you, that it's not really 100% hustler versus 100% CEO. There is a percentage. And different uh, businesses achieve that different level. So my question to you, how do you estimate your split between hustle and CEO in your business? Ah, right on. A uh, good, good question. So uh, when I started uh, niching controls, my fourth business, I ran three other ones uh, prior to this, and each of the three before working in corporate America, um, I was always working in the business. I created a web services uh, business where um, I created band pages. It was an HTML code for anybody who knows coding. <laughs> so I had to like recreate every single one of them. Uh, and as they became more popular, I basically burnt out. Um, and so I learned from these other three businesses that it's really important to have like a vision of the company. Um, I went into corporate America, learned about business systems, and then now I'm bringing that into my own business. And what I realized was um, coaching in general has a cap uh, based around a certain model. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, there's only so many hours that I can sit in front and talk with you and, and go, okay, what are you working on, blah, blah, blah. So what I found was I created a leverage for growth method, which um, uh, basically it's a hybrid approach of my coaching model. So um, I have a, a program that kind of walks through all the different steps. If you just took the program, went line by line, you'd get the result. Um, but I speed it up with coaching on top of that. So it's not only like a course, but it's also the coaching, which makes it so that the time that it takes for me to get results for clients is way faster than going one-on-one -on -one, uh, with it. So um, in answer to your question, I work on the business as much as humanly possible. Um, uh, anytime that I'm not on the phone in a sales call or um, building this program and, and kind of making it better, um, I am, yeah, I'm, I'm with clients. It's like the three um, parts of it. So with, with, with clients, it's kind of like um, you're working in the business, but it's not really like firefighting. It's just kind of part of a conversation that I have with people. Um, but uh, but yeah, in answer to your question, I, I do as much working on the business as humanly possible, which ends up being more the majority of the time. I think Fadi had a question like 20 minutes yeah. ago. Fadi. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Bethy, I, I always like to help my clients focus on at least three main areas in their business. And what I've continuously found that sales is one of the number one things 
mm-hmm. you know, because revenue, um, if you have the, the proper revenue, you have the resources, as you mentioned, to hire mm-hmm. people to do, to be able to do the things that need to be done that you're not very good at or you mm-hmm. can enjoy, enjoy doing, mm-hmm. or as Dr. Kim calls it, uh, your zone of genius. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, in a coaching business, the second thing that you would do is coach, right? Mm-hmm. And the third is kind of a, could be a wild card. It just really depends on your acumen, your abilities, your, your likes. It could be recruiting. Mm-hmm. It could be putting systems in place. You could be uh, writing, uh, a mm-hmm. number of things. So um, w- uh, my question for you is a two. two. Um, how much time would you... S- yourself and uh, for your clients recommend uh, to spend on average hourly on uh, sales. That's the mm. first question. Sure. And the second one is how many things should a CEO actually be doing uh, in a month time? In a month, mm-hmm. I most often is like 101, uh, but realistically, at least 20 to 25 is what I've continuously find and mm-hmm. a lot of CEOs are doing, which this is one of the reasons they struggle in growth is because they're yep. trying to do a lot of things that, that they're not very good at. Yep. So, does that make sense? Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, I think I would answer the question not based on a, an actual number amount of hours because there's not really like a, a perfect uh, fit to it. Um, I'll tell you what the the... I'll tell you what the strategy that I teach my clients is, is I help them make it to where it's client fulfillment is a well-oiled machine. So they can't get pulled back into the business because they're working on top of it. Um, As they start to shift, they go towards uh, client attraction. So marketing, how do you set up the three legs of of a client attraction, referral systems, incentivizing referral systems, uh, inbound marketing, and then outbound marketing. Have all three of those going. It shouldn't be a problem to fill up your pipeline uh, and then move into a sales but um, that whole process is to free them up because I've found even from my own uh, experience and also with my clients that if they say, okay, I'm going to spend 20 hours a day focused on sales, um, then what happens is while they're focused on trying to do that, they get called and something random pulls them back into working in the business. And then uh, they have a sales call right after trying to fix something technical. They're not in the right state. So what I would say is, is that you, the, the goal of this whole thing is you build a system that can sustain and grow without you as much as humanly possible. It becomes a well-oiled machine. You can put people in and, and you know, it's way easier to attract client fulfillment. You know, if you're going in the weeds, you can come back and you can see exactly where people are. That's number one. Second thing is, is that that time that gets freed up, then you start shifting towards filling that pipeline. So, um, and having sales uh, conversations, increase that as much as humanly possible. Then as you're like, your cash flow is going and you're good, then you can start putting people into the roles that fulfill the client. So you can focus on sales. And then that becomes your main thing as you keep on feeding this uh, pipeline. And then eventually you start building out sales teams and then they take over whole parts. So it's like, it, it's, that's the evolution um, that happens. So in answer to your question, um, there's not a specific number amount. And because there's not really like a, a, a polis star of like, if I work, if I, if I have 20 hours a week on sales then I'm good, you know, um, but it's well, like that a, transition a that you're making. Of where, oh, excuse me for cutting you off. My point sure. is a percentage of where their efforts are, you know, they're being spent on. I, I just see so many, spend a lot of time and energy in the wrong place. Yeah, very, very good point. Uh, Let me go back to what you had said about 25 things that a CEO is doing, (laughs) which is so bad. Uh, What you need to do is you need to niche down. That's why niche and control is actually a company name is because you need to focus, like laser focus on the thing that makes you different than everybody else. Um, When somebody's doing something like, you know, 25 things, um, I wish I had the diagram right now of the two circles. I don't know if you've seen this, Fadi, but uh, the two circles and one of them is just like arrows, like one inch arrows all across the whole thing. And they're not going anywhere because they're just going like this. And then if you just took all those arrows and just put them into one, you're going a lot farther. And that's that's the idea. You really need to niche down and focus on the thing that differentiates you, create a blue ocean in the red ocean, and uh, really just make that kind of your 
that's your bread and butter. You're not really focused on 25 things because you have the thing that you're focused on. Well, and Jesse, can I jump in really fast, on, especially on the, the sales part? Sure. Uh, the one thing that I always you know, work with business owners is what, what is your strengths? And I know a lot of business owners, well, I know how to sell. And there's a lot of business owners that they, they have no idea how to, and they're not good at it. They, especially people with technology companies is because they know the technology so well and they, they want to go so deep in the weeds with it, but they don't need to. And so sometimes, you know, basically how much time should you spend on sales? First of all, do you want to do sales? If not, then find, find someone to do it for you. Find, find another face for your business to, to bring you in to close the deal, but not to start the whole process. Uh, so, I mean, understand what you're really good at, focus on what you're good at and outsource the rest. <laughs> because if you're the one thing that will kill a business is if you're not good at sales and you're talking with a, a possible great client and you just stumble, fumble and blow it. And you could have had somebody else in there that closed that deal. That's what you need to pay attention to. And, and again, there's nothing, I, I know what I'm not good at. I get, I, I don't want to deal with accounting. I bring you, I, could I do my books? Sure. Do I want to do my books? Heck no. And I, I know where I am good at and I know where I'm not good at. And I bring other people in to support me in the areas that I'm not good at. Mm -hmm. And so, Rob, just Rob, to, I'm sorry. Sorry, Jesse. Real quick, Troy. Um, so <clears throat> one thing that I would add to that, uh, the reason why I focus on the strategy of making that transition and then doing it yourself before you build out sales teams is because of all of the time you've spelt, spent directly with the clients before, you should know your market pretty well of what worked and what didn't work. Um, if you're if you're totally blind and you really don't know what you're doing, then obviously getting somebody to uh, give advice on things is really important. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And then I've also found just from, from being a sales manager before doing, you know, door to door sales and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you know, what it's like being in the trenches, <laughs> it's a lot easier for you to like delegate something or know when something's being done wrong. And that's part of the reason why you wear a lot of hats in the way beginning. You have to figure out how your business is going to operate. So if it does go awry, you're able to course correct it as well. So um, I totally agree with you. That I just think that it is important for them to at least start to try sales, try to figure out what the messaging is. Um, but by the time that I'm usually talking with uh, clients, they at least have already gotten a proof of concept and some sales uh, going. So uh, we just kind of. Oh, and I completely agree. They need to have a foundation and understand what it is. They may not always be able to need to know the intricacies of sales and what's involved with it, but I completely agree with you. They need to know the process and they need to have a foundation of it. Otherwise, they're, they're not going to know yep. how to talk to their salespeople. You're absolutely right. Yep. Cool. It, it sounds like the, um, the, the sales portion is one of the other final hats that, that, you, that you know, so you can end eventually be the face of the company. And then even after the face, you can not be the face, you know, um, so you're going to stay in the trenches in order to know how to uh, um, communicate well with your prospects to convert those clients and pass that knowledge over. Um, I think sales is one of the hardest ones to kind of let go because you got your hands in the cookie jar. You know, you're personally involved with those people. Um, but yeah, and then just handing that off to someone else that has a totally different personality <laughs> probably is a task in itself. Yeah, and one, one last thing. Um, it also depends on the model that you're using to do sales. So if you wanted to stay as the chief salesperson and you're realizing that your calendar is packed with strategy sessions one-on-one -on -one all the time, and there's only so many hours that you can actually do with that, uh, starting to transition towards webinars or different ways that you can do like the one to many um, is another way of still scaling, still staying in the chief uh, you know, sales officer role, um, but uh, still having control over that while you're uh, reaching a lot more. So it really depends on st like strategy and kind of where you're going and what the business model actually is. Jesse, um, thank you very much. Uh, before, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. I uh, just want to see if anyone wants to ask any other questions. This has been very valuable to me. I don't know anyone else, but I think it's been, been really good. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, um, um, I'm sorry, Spotty, did you raise your hand? No. I oh, you said it was an okay symbol. Okay, got it. Got caught <laughs> under my eye. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. <laughs> And uh, anyone who dropped their LinkedIn URL, I'll go ahead and uh, message them tomorrow. Um, we're going to do a post that has the that has the PDF on there. 
and all, all the screens on there. So I appreciate it and feel free to connect with, uh, with Jesse. Um, and, in that, and he's very open as far as um, giving advice and that sort of thing. All right. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great cool. day. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>